What's up, everybody? Welcome to a brand new episode of Mutt Tips. I'm your host, Sean Taylor, from the Made Up Theater. And before we jump in, make sure to like the video down below, comment with somebody you would like addressed in a future video. And as always, subscribe on YouTube down below to be informed of upcoming videos and live streams. Ring that bell. Now let's jump into today's topic, variety in short form improv shows. Today's video is a continuation of last week's video, which is all about variety and long form improv shows. And today we're focusing on short form improv. And I said this at the beginning of last week's video is there is a big difference between long form improv and short form improv. Long form improv is based solely on grabbing maybe one suggestion at the top of a show and improvising various sets or formats that don't require you to go back to the audience and end scenes. It's more seamless in the way it flows. And short form improv, similar to Whose Line Is It Anyway, that is a style where there's a, a direct host who explains rules of predetermined games and has various cast members perform these games based on suggestions from the audience. So it's a little bit more interactive. Uh, I've heard it really referred to as a more mainstream form of improv. It's the improv that most people are aware of. And I won't get into other like similarities and differences between long form and short form. Again, I'll reference you to uh, good old Paul Valencourt's improv tip episode 162. So check that up right there. It is down in the description down below to get some more insight into the differences. But today let's focus on variety as well as structuring short form improv shows. For short form improv shows, think of it almost like a band about to perform a concert. Backstage, that is when they discuss what is called the set list for them or a running order where we decide on games that we want to play. And we also order those games. And the point of ordering the games, very similar to a sketch comedy show, is to vary up tone, vary up pacing, and vary up style, you know? So that the audience is constantly being rewarded for being invested in the show. They get to see a bunch of different types of games. And I'm actually gonna go over types of short form improv games, as well as how we can vary up the way we utilize these games to make the show, again, satisfying and unexpected. This video is gonna be a little bit on the long side. So if you wanna watch the whole video, awesome. If you'd like to jump to specific sections, take advantage of the timestamps down below. Let's start first with a scene-based game. This is a game that is presented as an improvised scene, almost like an improvised narrative, but within three to five minutes. It might even have a beginning, middle, and end with various characters interacting and exploring some short story. But the catch is that in this, there's usually a gimmick attached to it. So an example might be the game of Blind Line, where the performers do a scene, but before the scene, they leave the room and the audience gives out lines of dialogue that will be used by the, uh, the cast members once they return to the stage throughout the scene. So that is the gimmick, the game of the scene. There's also like Shakespeare, where you just do a short form, three to five minute Shakespearean play, trying to use those characters, those that language, the themes of the immortal bard, only within three to five minutes, as opposed to like a long form improv set. So scene base is strictly presenting an improvised acted story. Another type of game is the guessing game. This is where one person leaves the room and various suggestions are gathered from the audience and that person returns and their goal is to guess what was collected from the audience. Now the presentation of the guessing game varies based on style as well as performance. So there's a game called Crime Story where the guesser becomes a criminal and they're trying to guess a crime and a motive and an accomplice based on clues from the other characters who are playing like detectives or lawyers or stuff and they're not allowed to say, you know, the things involved with a confession. So if the crime was like brushing their teeth, then the detectives can't say brushing their teeth. They have to get the person who's guessing, you know, drop them hints until they say it themselves first. So there's other types of guessing game, like guessing games that involve gibberish and pantomime, where there's a fake language that is, you know, put into the way clues are conveyed, as well as physicalization. There's also games where like, you know, the guesser is the only person talking. Like maybe they're the host of a home shopping network and they're just talking and hosting that show while the other people are dropping pantomime based clues, trying to get them to guess maybe like five items that would be on the home shopping network, maybe with some substitutions too. So the guessing game is, it's really, it's a fun type of style for the short form improv show because the audience is in on the joke and they love to see the success as well as the failure with this type of game. Another type of game is the elimination game. 
This is a game that has a competitive edge to it. And your show does not need to be competitive. There are short form improv shows that have a competitive nature where it's like two teams competing against each other or maybe various improvisers competing against each other to be you know, deemed the winner of the night at the end of the show. You can just throw these in as a way to kind of just change up the pace, change up the tone of the show, make it a little bit more competitive. People love competition sometimes. So this type of game essentially pits maybe one improviser against another improviser, or maybe it's like a free-for-all where all improvisers are competing against each other. An example of that might be the game of story, where the host is conducting a story and pointing at various cast members. Anytime they're being pointed at, they have to tell a story based on a suggested title from the audience. And if the host pulls their hand away, they stop, and the person who's pointed at next picks up exactly where they left off. And obviously, mistakes happen in that game, and if a mistake happens, you're eliminated. Now, the thing about elimination games is, hey, it's kind of like who's line. The points don't really matter. In a way, it's kind of fake, right? But we still treat it as though it's a real thing. So we treat the success with big high energy, but also the defeats with big high energy. I love to lose at elimination games, you know? Especially when it feels like I really lost. Really embellish in those moments. And again, elimination games change up just kind of the presentation of your short form improv show. You don't want to overdo elimination games, but they're a fun addition, a fun little spice to your improv show. Another type of game is the physical gimmick game. This is a game where the gimmick is the physicality. So there's various games that do this, like sit, stand, kneel, which is a game where three people perform, but only one person is allowed to be sitting, one person standing, and one person kneeling the whole time. If two or more of them do the exact same motion, they have to quickly adjust themselves to fit in to the rules of that game. There's forward reverse where, you know, a group of improvisers do a scene, but the host can control the scene and go in reverse where they speak the dialogue in reverse and do the actions in reverse as well. There's countdown, a game where, you know, essentially a group does a scene for like 90 seconds and then the host has them do that exact same scene again, but they're going to cut the time in half and then again cut the time in half. So the emphasis again is on the physicality. With physical gimmick games, just bear in mind, people perform differently. People have maybe some you know, physicality issues like disabilities. So check in with your performers and make sure they're okay with playing these types of games. Physicality doesn't have to be crazy though, okay? And even sometimes the physicality of a game might just be exclusive to one or two people. Like there's a game that's called Dime Store Novel, which can have physicality in it, but one person is just the narrator and is just sitting in a chair, typing at a typewriter and narrating the story while the other performers act out the scene. And there would be maybe some physicality in that scene. So again, just check in, always be in the know with your performers and make sure that they're all cool. Another type of game is the host interrupt game. This is a game where the host is actively participating in the presentation. So this is one where like, you know, there might be a game like New Choice, which is a scene based game, but the host is actively calling out a command of New Choice. And that means when New Choice is called on a performer, they have to come up with something different. So someone might come up and say, hey, I got you a gift for your anniversary. New Choice, I got you a baby from the adoption center. New Choice. I got you the key to the castle in Me Netherland, <laughs> you know, something like that. It's a difficult challenge. And the fun of it is that there's the immediacy of someone to react to the voice of God that the host is in this case. Another type of game is the justification game. There's a lot of games that use this concept, which is being thrown something and just making it feel as though it was a part of what was meant to be. Blind line, you're picking up a line that you have no clue what it's gonna say, you read it and you have to treat it as though it fits, you know? It's a puzzle piece that was thrown at you and you have to instantly put it down on the board and make it fit. You know, the game of new choice, like being called new choice on and having to just come up with something random and different and then having to go with one of those choices, that is justification. You have to make something work. Taking a suggestion from the audience is justification in and of itself. Like you're taking an inspiration from them and making it like really embellishing in it and making it feel like this is the best thing you could have possibly given to us. We're gonna make it the best thing you've ever seen. Justification is shown in a lot of improv games. So there are games that really focus on it though. So we do wanna 
you know, bear in mind that we do want to balance the types of justification games we're playing as well as spacing them out in our running order. And I'll get into that in just a little bit. Another type of game is the replay game. There's various short form games that require you to do a setup scene and then replay that setup scene, taking on various endowments. The game of Countdown that I talked about, that is a replay game because you're seeing the same game done several times, but just in shorter and shorter time. You might do a replay game where you change the genre every time you redo that scene or maybe you take a, a cast member out of the scene and the other people have to fill in for that cast member until it gets down to one person doing the scene that they did in the initial part, but filling in all of the parts. So it becomes very frantic, fun, and challenging. This type of game, it can be a little long. So bear in mind, when you're structuring your show, you also wanna pay attention to where you're putting these games. So like guessing games can be kind of long too, because there's that time where the person's out of the room and you're getting suggestions. And if you do a guessing game and follow it up with a replay game, those are two long games back to back. So that could be a little tiresome for your, uh, your audience. So just bear in mind, we wanna look at timing in addition to what we're showcasing. Another type of game is the audience game. This is where we directly involve somebody from the audience, at least one, maybe two, and put them in the show essentially, and they do a role. An example of this is the game of moving bodies where you know the cast members perform a scene but the audience member that has chosen, at least one, maybe two or three, they provide the movements for the cast members on stage. And another game is like where the audience member like does sound effects in a microphone and the cast members do a scene and incorporate the sounds into their scene. Or the good old fashioned game of freeze tag where like you just do the game of freeze tag but the audience member never leaves. They are never tapped out in this version, okay? That makes them the star. The cool thing about using an audience member is first of all, it really is a special moment for them. They get to be a star of a show, you know? And that's something that really is special, not just for them, but for us too. Like we get to really focus on the key fundamental of improv, making our partner look good. In this type of game, we make our audience member look like the star of the show for that special moment. And it really speaks to our skills as improvisers to be able to take a random person out of the audience and make them feel like they're a cast member in the show. Now, audience games, you don't wanna use too many of them. I say like two or three because Ultimately, we want the focus on, you know, the ensemble. And we don't need to feel like we're constantly going to the audience, like we need them to constantly fill in, like almost a void in our show. We don't have a void in our show. If anything, this is just, again, a little cherry on top. It's like, hey, you see us perform on stage. How would one of you like to join us up here and just see what it feels like? So don't overdo it. You're constantly using the audience throughout the show, getting suggestions, but hey, a little special moment, get one or two of them on stage, make them feel like they're a part of the show, and hey, you got a special moment. Another type of more visual game is the stand of the line game. This is a game where there's not a lot of emphasis on physicality. It's almost usually conveyed in the form of the performance on stage in somewhat of a line or like almost a, a curved line, like a semicircle, and they do a specific game, you know? It could be advice panel, where each of the cast members gets like a suggestion of a character from the audience, and they step forth and just answer a question from the audience as that character. The game of story that I talked about earlier is a stand in the line game because again, it's more of a stage picture. You know, it's, I, I consider it more of like verbal games where the emphasis isn't on like utilizing the stage, utilizing the space, more so utilizing your skill as an improviser, the wit, you know, the energy that you deliver and accompany your lines of dialogue. So this is one of those things that we wanna bear in mind like, Stand in line games can get a little bit tiresome if you play too many of them back to back because the audience has seen a line. But if you have like a lot of like physical based game and then suddenly you just do like a more subdued game where they're just in a line, then that's a change. And that's something I think the audience will appreciate. A game that's a little similar to stand in line games is the one liner game. This is a game that's more in the realm of like a joke telling game or World's Worst, where you get a suggestion of an occupation or an event, and you come and just deliver usually just one line to justify you know, the suggestion that you got from the audience. Or, you know, I kissed a, you know? It's not necessarily one line, but the emphasis is on that punchline, you know? That big exclamation mark you give your moment in the spotlight. 
And I said, it's kind of like a standing line game where it's mostly usually in a standing formation or step out scenes almost. Very short though, very short. Usually relies on getting a lot of uh, suggestions from the audience, very snappy and all about commitment. I usually like to put these more towards the end of the show because I think it's, it's an earned game. You don't want to start with like a punny joke telling game right at the start of the show because I don't know, people can look at that and be like, oh, is this what we're about to watch? Just people doing pun jokes all the time? No, let's earn it from them. Showcase all of our talents and then end with something that, hey, we can all groan at, we can all laugh at, but it's something that I think we built up to strongly, so we've earned this moment. And one of my favorite games, the musical game, baby. This is the showcasing singing unscripted lyrics. The game of hoedown from Whose Line Is It Anyway? The game of greatest hits from Whose Line Is It Anyway? If you're singing, then that fits in this category. And this brings up a good point. If you don't like singing, then hey, don't do it, you know? I always say people should, you know, challenge yourself and do things that maybe you're not comfortable with, but some people are just not like, I don't like singing, they might think that. And that's fine, don't force them to do it. You'll notice on Whose Line Is It Anyway, Wayne Brady is usually the person singing, you know? In the game of greatest hits, you never see Colin or Ryan in that, right? Because they know their skills. They know that they are strong at banter and being the host, pitching this compilation disc. And hey, Wayne Brady, he's an amazing improviser when it comes to musical improv. Let that guy do what he does best. So in show, sometimes you wanna like cast people to like fit with roles that they feel great at, you know? If there's people who are really good at characters, Put them in like games where you get specific characters from the audience, like dating game or advice panel. And hey, if you got good singers, people who love singing, put them in those musical games because they're a great showcase and probably one of the more impressive parts of the show. And another type of game is the risky game. The definition of a risky game kind of isn't set in stone. It could be a few things. It could just be the challenge of a game. Like there's a game that's called Scene in Reverse where a group of improvisers improvise a scene from the end backwards to the beginning. You know, that's challenging. I have a hard time doing that type of game, so I would call that a risky game. It also might just be in terms of the audience, you know? The size of the audience, the demographic. Like, you know, is it a young crowd? Is it an older crowd? Is it a, a more introverted crowd, extroverted crowd? You know, is, if it's a crowd of people who just, you know, came from a town hall meeting, that might differ from a crowd that just came from a bar across the streets. So sometimes you might play specific games that would be risky to a more like accepting, energetic crowd. And the risky games, you might wanna just consider before playing them. It might even be a game that you just learned. You just practiced for the first time at your last rehearsal. So there's an element of riskiness to it because you've never done it in front of an audience before. So with the risky game, just bear in mind, you know, like really assign to it like a classification. Is this a game that we're really comfortable with, a safe game, or is it a game that maybe, hey, we haven't really fine tuned this game too much, it's a little risky, but we do wanna play it in front of an audience. It's like a stand-up comedian telling a joke for the first time. There's an element of risk to it because they haven't tested it. So just bear in mind, when you're playing your show, I encourage you try out a risky game, but don't overdo it. If you do a full show of just all risky games, boy howdy, that could be tough, especially if the crowd is not buying into the risk. So just err on the side of caution, but have fun taking yourself out of your comfort zone. And last but not least is the hybrid game. This is a game that just combines several categories of games, and it's good to know what each game fits into in terms of its category. So for example, the game of Blind Line is a scene-based game, but it is also a justification game. You're taking something from the audience randomly and injecting it into the scene. The game of story that I talked about, where you conduct a story, that is a stand of the line game and, for, uh, and based on its presentation, but it's also an elimination game where people can get eliminated, or maybe they don't get eliminated. Then it's just a stand of the line game. So just as you're ordering your, your, your list of games for a show, like look at the classification of each game. Some of them might have more than one classification, and that's great, but that will factor in to how you order the show. So let's get into structuring the show. How do we order a show? Well, first, let's just start by picking games. You and your group just pick games that you would like to try out. Games that maybe are your favorite, but also maybe games that you just want to try out or haven't played for a while. That's I always want to try playing new stuff, especially in the online era. I always want to like present some different stuff to our audience every so often because I know we do. And bear in mind, this is something for you to consider. Are you getting a lot of new people? Or are you getting a lot of recurring guests? Recurring guests, to keep them recurring, you gotta vary it up and play different stuff. 
if it's a newer crowd and you know people you haven't seen, I, I really encourage you at the beginning of a show, a live show especially, pull the audience. Say, who's been here before? Like make some noise. And that'll help you gauge who's new and who has come before. And based on that, you know, you get to play to that a little bit, right? Show some variety for the uh, the recurring guests, but also play some games that are like successful and like, you know, crowd favorites. There are crowd favorites. Blind Line, for example, is a crowd favorite. People love that game. As you're figuring out what games you want to play, you also want to take into account the length of your show. Most short form improv shows might be like between 30 minutes to 90 minutes. If you're doing like a 30 minute set where like maybe you're a guest group going to perform in a show where there's other groups performing as well, 30 minutes, not a lot of time. So you're not gonna pick a ton of games, maybe like five, six, depending on how long you go. But if you do like an hour long show, then you'd probably shoot for seven to eight. And if you're going to 90 minutes, just bear in mind, you're gonna have an intermission. So maybe you just choose the games for the first half and then during the intermission when you're backstage, that's a time to think, hey, what is the audience like? What are they responding to? What's something we haven't given them? And you can choose those final games to fit into like that last 20, 30 minutes of a show. So really just consider the length of your show because that's really gonna correspond with the games that you choose and how many games you choose. When we're picking games, usually on like a whiteboard or a piece of paper, I do like to write down some of the categories sometimes. Like I write down guessing, I write down elimination, I write down gibberish or physical. And you know, we wanna try to see if we can hit most of those marks because then again, that's, in, that's injecting the variety into the show. So do that, like feel free to like throw in the categories, try to pick a game from each category because if you're picking too many games from one set category, you're not showing the audience the full potential of what you can actually do as an ensemble. You've got the games you wanna play, and now we need to focus on ordering the show. This is important, okay, because it can make or break a show sometimes. This is where you wanna take into account the categories of games. You don't wanna play two of the same category in a row, like two guessing games. That's like overkill. It's perfectly fine to play two guessing games on a show, but you wanna space them out a bit, you know? Put one at the beginning of the show and one towards the end. That's good pacing. You also wanna look at length. There's short improv games and long improv games. So like games that require people to leave the room, like guessing games or like, you know, the game like Blind Line where various suggestions are gathered from the audience while someone's out of the room or more people are out of the room, those are longer games. There are short games too, like the game of 90 Second Alphabet, for example, like a scene-based game where two people have to do a scene, but they have to begin each sentence with the next letter of the alphabet. Challenging game, short game though. So that is where pacing comes into play. I really recommend looking at each game that you like to play or games that you are playing and assigning it an average time. This game takes an average of two minutes to play. This game takes an average of five minutes to play. Boom, if you know those averages, you can space out and pace the show out perfectly. Probably one of the most important parts of a short form show is the first game of the show. This is your chance to hook the audience, okay? Because you got some people in the crowd who've never seen your group before. Maybe some people who have never seen an improv show before. So even though they're here to have a good time generally, like when, when people go to shows, they wanna have a good time. They're not there to like sit judgy, cross-armed in their chair, frowning the whole time, like make me laugh, funny guy. No, they wanna come and have a good time. You know, it's their escape but there's a sense of skepticism sometimes. Like they're like, oh man, I've never been to an improv show before. I hope it's good. So you gotta leave a good first impression. So sometimes it's good to start the show with something that your team is good at, you know? Like whose lives in any way? They're really good at the game Weird Newscasters where each of the four of them, they're a specific you know, person on a news segment and they're also given a character from the host and they just do a news segment and it's simple to them and it's, it's a good success rate. You know, they rarely mess up in that. So it's a good time to start the show with that game. You might also just start with something that's really energy focused, like a competitive game, you know, like a rotating elimination based game, but one that focuses on big energy. That's a great way to start a show too, because even though there's eliminations, failure that's being emphasized, it still is showcasing the fun that your group has, embracing failure. Okay, so start the top of the show with big energy, embracing failure, and also just saying, hey, this is our stage. You came to see us, let's have a good ass show. And if you wanna put this to practice, here's what I'm gonna do. 
In the description of this YouTube video, there is going to be eight games. I will give some brief descriptions as to what type of category it is, as well as like what the game is, and maybe like an average length. And based on the games, their descriptions, I want you to post in the comments below the order that you would put the games in. There's technically no right or wrong way to go about it, so just go with your gut and what you feel would be beneficial based on what I've taught you here today. And I'll comment and tell you, hey, I think that's good, or hey, here's what I would do, but it's a great way to practice, okay? I'm just gonna put some random games down there. Maybe I'll do a few different categories if you wanna try a few times. And hey, put everything that you've learned to practice right now. Ordering your show, variety in your show is so flipping crucial to get in the audience, to not only have a satisfying experience, but leaving them wanting more, leaving them wanting to see you again, okay? Try it out, baby! And that concludes this episode of Mud Tips, everybody. Thank you so much for checking it out. Again, like, comment, and subscribe, and I'll see you next time for another episode of Mud Tips. Bye!